Hello, this is Penny Peterson, Head of Outreach Services at the Orion Township Public Library. Today's date is March 29th, 2006. On May 12, 2000, I recorded or did an interview with Richard Lalone. And he was a resident of Orion Township, but we called it Spotlight on Orion's Unsung Heroes of World War II. And um, it's very riveting and um, I hope that you'll enjoy it. Mr. Lalone passed away in January of 2006 and we would like to dedicate this to his family's memory. Thank you. Richard Lalone moved to Orion in 1932 and lived on a farm at Silver Bell and Bald Mountain Roads. He married his childhood sweetheart, Betty Stowell, who also happened to be his neighbor. Richard was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1942 and was one of the first liberators at Mauthausen, Austria on May 5, 1945. Here is his story and the horrifying account of the Nazi concentration camp system. Oral history is a method of gathering and preserving historical information in spoken form. Today, we can combine this ancient technique with modern technology, thereby giving us something of enduring value, an eyewitness account of history. Oral history is also a form of folk history, not only of why events happened, but how they are perceived by the person interviewed. The Orion Township Library realizes the importance of gathering this information for further generations. With the advent of video, it adds yet another dimension to the oral history interview. Join us now for our Spotlight series, honoring Orion's unsung heroes of World War II. Oh, wedding there will be. Hello, my name is Penny Peterson, Head of Outreach Services at the Orion Township Public Library. Today, May 12, 2000, my guest is Richard Dick Lalone. Welcome, Dick. Thank you. And when and where were you born? I was born in Pontiac on uh, January 1st, 1922. Were you born at home? At home, on the corner of Baldwin and Rundle. And is that house still? No, that house was mistakenly torn down by the city of Pontiac <laughs> about five years ago or four years ago. Well, tell me about your family, your heritage. Where did your parents come from? Well, my father came from Canada, and my mother's folks came from Ireland, but uh, my mother was born in Indiana, my, and my father was born in uh, Hull, uh, Quebec. And uh, he came to this country when he was 12 years old. And my mother, I don't know how she was in this country. My mother and dad met. My mother was a cook in a lumber camp. My father was a lumberjack in that camp, and that's where they met. Where was that at? Uh, up by Kalkaski. Was that during the that when during you the big lumbering days? Yeah. You know, the lumbering days. You know. uh, and your that's where your dad worked. That's the, where he started. Yeah, you know, he ended up as a as a carpenter builder, uh, home builder. So then, when did they move down to this? Area? Where did they move? They moved from Rosebush, Michigan, which is near Mount Pleasant in the spring of 1913 with a horse and wagon they moved to Pontiac and my sister was a year and a half old and my oldest brother was a baby and it took them three days to move here and they moved and uh, rented a house on Pike Street in Pontiac near across from where the police station is now and then my dad bought the house on the corner of Baldwin and Rundle and what did your dad do then? When he, he was a carpenter, he, he worked. He worked first. He, he sold the horse that moved down here with to the Bedet Lumber Company, and they used to body car bodies were had a lot of wood in them, and they kept the lumber outside. And he hired in as after he sold them the horse, he hired in to drive the horse to bring the lumber in. <laughs> then he got into the carpenter work, and he he ended up as a builder, a carpenter builder. He built a lot of houses in the city of Pontiac. So how uh, many brothers and sisters did you have? I have three. I have three brothers. Did have three brothers and one sister. My sister was the oldest. My next oldest brother was a was a pastor of Donaldson Baptist Church for years. He's died. 
And the next oldest had a grocery store in Pontiac and a... What was the name of the... Uh, Rosebud Market on the corner of uh, Auburn and East Boulevard. And he sold the store and and retired and built a, bought, a, bought a house out here on Walden Road in Orion Township. And the next brother to me is still alive. There, there are two of us still alive and, and he's a tool and die maker as, as I was. You were a tool and die maker. Originally, okay. yeah. So you lived in Pontiac and and <clears throat> where did you go to school? I went I started in the Wisner School in Pontiac in a public school and then I transferred to a, a St. Michael's and went there until uh, 11th grade. And then I quit school and uh, we moved on the farm. And uh, the, during the depression, my dad my dad lost everything he had. So when did you move and, to Orion? We moved in Orion Township in 1934. So that would have been right in the depression. Right, during, right, after, right during the depression, yeah. And uh, my dad rented the farm, which is now High Hill Village. And How old were you then? Well, I was 12. Okay. And I started working on farm day work uh, for my wife's grandfather, whose farm was uh, across the road from us. And I worked uh, daily for him, uh, driving the horses, plowing, cultivating, whatever had to be done. Until And then I would go to school in the winter, but I quit school and, and went to work in General Motors truck plant. But now when you... When I was you, 18. When you're talking about your wife's family, tell me a little bit. She was a uh, stole. Her which name was, was one of her the... name was Stole, and her great great grandfather homesteaded the farm on well, the corner of Ball Mountain and Silver Bell Road. Now would that have been Ball Mountain then? Ball, it... Well, it was a Ball Mountain Road, okay. but it was uh, wasn't you. It, you couldn't drive over it now, yeah. over the north part. She had <clears throat> her. Uh, she had a, a, a another great great grandfather that owned property from Orion to Rochester. He could walk on his own property, and uh, he'd buy a, a section of property every year when, through the government, I suppose, homesteaded or. Uh, Tell us about that house that she lived in. Well, that, the house, the sole farmhouse, was a huge farmhouse, and uh, I'm not sure, but I think it was probably 18 or 20 rooms. And it burned down in 1940. Okay, now what was your house like that you? Well, the house that we had, had lived in, there had been a, a farmhouse there previously, and that burned down. And the house that we lived in was moved out of Detroit, uh, off of Grand Boulevard in Detroit, in the, oh, in the early 30s. And my dad remodeled it, fixed it up. That's where we lived. And there was a barn there. We had the farm and. How many acres do you know? Uh, it was 120 acres on our farm, and on Grandpa Stoll, my wife's family's farm, it was over 200 acres. And what did you uh, raise on the farm? Did you have oh, cow, uh, cows dairy and, cows? Dairy cows and potatoes and uh, wheat, oats, whatever, you know, general farming then. It was uh, dairy farming mostly. Did you have um, threshers come in? Every year, there, it, farmers exchanged help. The thrashing machine would, would go and the farmers in the area at all help the other ones and, and some, it'd take about a month sometimes to, and they'd sometimes uh, a big farm would have two or three days of thrashing. And the same when they filled silo, they all cha exchanged help. We had several neighbors, uh, Judd Howarth, and Porritz, Russell and Ori Port, Grover Shimmons, and all those, and, and Grandpa Stoll and my dad, they all changed help. And because it, for the young people watching this, that was one of the things of farming, was that they had to all work together to get every all the crops right. in. So they would all have all the, this group of, oh. of yeah. men come, and they were called the threshers. Everybody, and the, everybody helped. Yeah. And the woman's job was to cook, cook the, the meals. Dinner, and they and were fabulous. The, and they were 12 course dinners, weren't they? Huge. Yes, huge they were. Do you remember anything about going into the town of Lake Orion? Yeah, we we uh, we went in quite often. How old were you when you? Well, I was too young to be running around, but I did. <laughs> but my were older you brother, bad? Uh, <laughs> not really bad, but to, uh, not compared to what it would it would be called that now. But well, we we had our, our little times in Orion. 
Uh, did you have, uh, who are your like best friends and stuff that you hung around with? Uh, mostly the guys that worked on the farms. Uh, uh, my wife's, my wife's father drowned, him and his brother-in-law drowned in Buckhorn, or in Elkhorn Lake in 1933. Yeah, and, tell how they drowned. They were, they were fishing, uh, opening day of fishing season, and uh, they had hip boots on in a boat, and somehow or another the boat capsized, uh, they, they assumed that's what happened. And uh, Sheriff Howard, at the time, was driving by and seen a fish, a cane pole sticking up out of the water. And they investigated and they found that they were both drowned in that lake. And they were, and one of, both one standing, of them, up. standing up and one of them was holding a fishing pole. And, and uh, her, and she her, was her, her, her aunt's husband, which was the brother-in-law, they had a, a baby of five days old and he drowned. And we just saw him the other day at the Oregon reunion. His name was uh, Odine, Jerry Odine. As a family, when you were growing up, what did your family do for fun, recreation? Played ball, a uh, little golf. We'd sneak over on the Ball Mountain Golf Course on the third hole, play for nothing. <laughs> their farm, their golf course joined my grandfather or my wife's grandfather's farm. and. Uh, Oh, the usual things kid done that. Somebody would find a car that we could drive. And we'd joyride? Joyride, yeah. Um, as far as, do you remember Park Island? Yes, I remember Park Island. Okay, tell us about what they you had, remember. They had rides there and dances, and, uh, and orchestra and dances at least once a week. Orient, Lake Orion used to have a, a free outdoor movie. They'd and show, that would be where? Uh, uh, it's where... Yeah, in the corner uh, of Flint where you take and Broad. The, the cutoff there, right on the lake, there's a little park. And they held that that movie. It was uh, every night, they have a free movie. What was the screen? Uh, the screen was put up outdoors there, and, uh, and uh, I don't know where they got their movies from, but they weren't, and of course they weren't the most modern, but there was there was movies, and there was a place to collect. Uh -huh. Everybody would show up. And I always remember my older brother had a, a Model A Ford, Car, our Model T Ford, and he had a coil that uh, they used in the, to make, help somewhere make a run. And he took a screen uh, screen wire and would break off wires and put them in it so they'd stick up through the seat. And somebody sit down and he'd touch those wires, that coil. <laughs> and, and if people leaned, now that was a prank, and if people right? leaned on the fender where we couldn't see the movie, he'd also <laughs> give them a shot. So, um, did you uh, go on any of the rides at Park Island? Oh yeah, everybody went on the rides. And what about the I don't remember coaster? what rides or why. There was, it seemed to me like it was a roller coaster. Yeah, and, it was called the Thriller. Yeah, the Thriller, yeah. which today probably wouldn't be much, but no. it was, well, I guess it was it then. Was, it was a popular place. Yeah. A popular, real Park Island was a popular place. And what about, the, <coughs> do you remember the Bellevue Hotel? No, I don't, uh, I don't remember that. Uh, I remember uh, Barney's Tavern. Okay, Barney's Tavern. <laughs> and, that was in and, the village. Uh, and uh, oh, the guy, uh, there was a, another bar, I can't remember the name, right on Main Street. Wagon Wheel? The Wagon Wheel. And I remember when the bowling alley was built. Where was the bowling that alley? Was that right was below. On the first street, just before you get to the Wagon Wheel, there was a turn to right, and it was right on the left-hand side there. And I can't remember the name of the bowling alley. I think it was six alleys or four alleys, something like that. And it was around the corner. Right around, the, right by the hardware store. Um, what was your first car? Oh gosh. That that you drove legally. Uh, legally? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a 1930 Chevrolet my brother and I bought together. We never never did get license for it, but we drove it all the time. How far uh, did, it, did you go? All around, just around this area. You know. Ball Mountain and uh, Orion around. Did you get dates? Oh yeah, we had dates. I did dates with my wife then. Uh huh. Before. before okay, the... now tell me about um, Silver Bell Center. We call it Silver Bell Center. It was uh, originally it was located on the corner of Silver Bell and M24 uh, Perry. Uh, yeah. Originally there was a dance hall there. And uh, one how, went, how big of a dance? Uh, a big, quite a big dance hall, a, a, a round roof like a Quonset hut. 
And the guy that played drums in the band at that dance hall finally bought the whole corner. His name was M.D. Allen. And he ended up with a gas station, a restaurant, and his folks home behind it, and he built an airport. The Allen Airport. Uh, Allen Airport. And uh, I helped start, when they started building that, I helped them with it. And then I went in the service while, while that was being built. And that dance hall, one winter the snow caved the roof in, and they tore it down. And there was a, an old stone gas station was set in front of it, and that stood there for years. I don't think it's there now. It's, it's no, it's not, not there then. Howarth Church is still... The Howarth Church is still there, and uh, well, they built a new one. Yeah. And the Howarth School, my wife went to that school, and uh, I always told her the reason she got good marks, and I hope she don't see this, was because the teacher boarded at their house. <laughs> oh, well, then, you know, that's no, easy. Wife, yeah, that's easy. She was a very smart girl. Okay, how old were you when you met Betty? Oh, gosh, uh, 14, 15 years okay. old. Okay, and you've been married now how many years? 57 years. 57 years. And when you were married, who proposed? Do you remember that? I think I did, uh, from, uh, uh, by letter, from after I went in the service. Oh, so we were married on, uh, on, uh, on my last furlough before I went overseas. And and uh, so what year was that in? 1943. 1943. March of 43. Okay, and how many children did you have? Two, and a boy and a girl. Incidentally, I'd like to uh, uh, tell you a little story about my wife when uh, she was born in 1923. She'll probably kill you at, for that. Well, okay. at that farmhouse on May 13th, and they had to have a team of horses tow the doctor's car in through the snow to get to the house. In May? May 13th, 1923. And a funny side, side story to that, my wife went to, was on her way to come down to camp in Kentucky where I was, and she was in Chicago and got into a taxi cab to take her to the railroad station. And the cab driver said, where, where are you from? She said, Michigan. He said, oh, gosh, I was up there in 1923. There was so much snow you couldn't walk on May 13th. And she said, yeah, I know it. That was my... And that's when I was born. The Lalone family is a prominent family in Orion. Yeah. And tell me some of your relatives' names. and. Well, probably the, the most prominent in Orion would be Glenn Lalone. He's dead. That's my next to oldest brother. And he was involved in the, in the Orion affairs quite a bit. And his daughter is, I guess, yeah, she was in the... She in was the, Marie English, uh, and she was the township clerk. Township clerk for years. And her mother, Ethel. Ethel, hold on. She... Ethel uh, was, uh, no, she lived on Greenshield Road, her and her sister, and we we all dated back and forth for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and where are your children now? My son is, uh, lives in, in Howell. He's a, he's a facilities engineer for a Chrysler Proving Ground in Chelsea. And my daughter lives one house away from me, and she's a professor at OCC and a librarian at Walsh College. So we all have something in common, uh, don't we? Yes, yeah, she works two different colleges, actually. Uh, OCC and uh, North, Northwood, they have a satellite she works there. And what night. about grandchildren? And I have seven granddaughters, four great-grandsons, and five great-granddaughters. The last one was born in February in Scotland, and we were there. How wonderful. Okay, we're going to take a little break. Need access to a wide range of resources? You've got it. Need business information, full text articles? You've got it. Want education and career news, personal hobby, recreation and travel tips, or maybe cool sites for kids? You've got it all. And it's free, easy, and readily available to every Michigan resident in every area of the state. MEL, the Michigan Electronic Library. Visit your local library and try it today. One of the main reasons that we are interviewing Mr. Lalone today is the story of Mauthausen. And the following uh, synopsis is taken from In the Shadow of Death by Gordon Horowitz. 
Mauthausen was a town that lay in the heart of Austria. Its involvement with the concentration camp system in Nazi Germany began in 1938. At that time, four camps already existed in the Third Reich. Authority over the camps lay in the hands of the SS, the notorious security force under the direction of Heinrich Himmler. At first, the camps consisted mostly of political prisoners, such as social democrats and trade union later leaders. When Hitler named Himmler chief of the German police, it paved the way for new arrests. The camp's population now included misfits, labeled as socials, suspected of vagrancy, poor work histories, beggars, drunks, and this group also included gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, and then the Jews. The Germans needed manpower for its state economic projects, and where better than to use the prisoners from the concentration camp system than to form the enterprise that is, was established as the German Earth and Stone Works Corporation. This was to acquire stone quarries and brickworks capable of supplying at a profit to the SS construction materials for the building program. The expanding camp system formed a ready pool of slave labor. Mauthausen was one of the stone quarries that was acquired. The SS intended Mauthausen to be the harshest of the concentration camps. Inmates sent there were deemed incapable of being rehabilitated and not qualified for eventual release. It represented a death sentence to the inmates, never to return to the outside world. The inmate slaves quickly became badly nourished and mistreated. The camp grew from 7,000 inmates to nearly 25,000 when the war broke out in 1939. The inmates were literally worked to death. Dressed in white, blue and gray striped uniforms, the inmates were identified by patches sewn on their uniforms, and they were as follows. The criminals wore a green triangle, the political prisoners a red triangle, the asocials a black, black the Jehovah Witnesses purple, homosexuals pink, and the Jews wore yellow stars of David. From 1944 to 1945, conditions inside the camps deteriorated sharply. Supplies dwindled, and as camps that were closest to the front were dissolved as the enemy approached, the Nazis forced inmates on relentless and deadly evacuation marches towards camps in the interior. If one camp was full, they were marched to another. The dehumanized murderers did not see the prisoners as human beings at all. These death marches took a devastating toll. Above and beyond the millions of Jews already killed, over 700,000 inmates were still in the camps in January 1945. Of these, half died suffering the effects of their mistreatments. In Mauthausen, the inmates worked in the quarry leveling the area, laying an approach road, and constructed buildings. In accordance with the SS guidelines, a process of deliberate extermination was carried out. So much killing required a means of disposal, hence cremation facilities were installed inside the camp. Each day, inmate laborers set out to work in the quarries. At dawn, the gate was opened, the prisoners marched to the quarries guards took up their posts. At nightfall, the inmates who survived the day filed back to the camp. The inmates were aware that while they suffered and comrades died, other people lived peacefully nearby, yet inaccessible. On the way to and from camp, there were white houses on the left side of the road and on the right side. Sometimes a curtain would move as the local residents would quickly glance at the prisoners marching to and from the quarry each day. The existence of these posed a dilemma that inmates that survived have struggled to resolve. Some could not. How could these human beings that watch this going on remain indifferent? So let us move on to May 5th, 1945, 
when the forces of the 71st Division came upon the outpost of the notorious Mauthausen concentration camp. Dick, as one of the first liberators, let us begin with when you were drafted and where did you serve? I was drafted in 1942, served my uh, training at Battle Creek, Camp Custer, was then transferred to a 12th Armored Division, Combat Engineers, 119th Company E. After the war, I was, uh, got, got in the, the heavy part of the war, they streamlined the armored divisions and took Company E and D out of it. E, we were, we had Treadway Bridge, which is a fast built, a bridge to be built, and demolitions was our main uh, job. So, and when we went overseas, that's what we, we were sent over there for. I was involved in the invasion of D-Day at D-Day H hour, and our job was to blow up, blow obstacles out of the way for the troop standard. So you were at Normandy on June 6th? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me a little bit about that? It was, it was, uh, as probably everyone knows, it was horrible. But uh, you didn't really have time to think. And uh, anybody, including myself, that got through Normandy were very few and far between. And I'm a very lucky man. Okay. So that was part of the campaign in Europe that led up to your arrival in Austria. Uh, tell us about that, how you got to Austria. Well, we, we traveled all over France. My company was, uh, we had 142 men in our company, and we had 130 of those men that were, to, you know, for work purposes. The other others were uh, administration mm -hmm. headquarters. And we were split in two, divi two parts. One part would go with one division, and the other part with another. And we was there to build quick bridges, blow up obstacles, blow uh, uh, minefields. That was our main job. And the part, the, the part of the uh, division I, or a camp company I was with was was involved in the liberation of Paris, or, and we were assigned at that time to the French Second Armored Division. So we were assigned to different outfits, and when we uh, we went to the Battle of the Bulge was with the Third Army, and from there we went on the spearheads across to Europe. After we crossed, or we built a bridge across the Rhine River, and got the the tanks and equipment over, and then we went on what they call the spearheads. You'd maybe drive a hundred miles in a day until we run out of gas, and that's where we ended up at Mauthausen was uh, on a spearhead at, at Linz, Austria, near Linz, Austria. Okay, so you were at Linz, Austria, which was close to Mauthausen. Right, about 14 miles. Okay, and how did it come that you entered the camp? Uh, strictly for liberation of the camp, and uh, we were there just one day, and pulled back out, and uh, started on another spearhead, and the, and the war ended. We were we had gone back to Ch Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, the day the war ended. And okay. we came back to Linz, Austria, and stayed there after that. Okay, but now at Mauthausen, it was liberated May 5th, 1945, right. and that's when you were there. And what was your rank at that time? Staff Sergeant. Okay. And when you asked, when asked to go to the camp and dig dishes, were you aware of what the camp was? I, I knew what it was, yes. And it was, were you told? My, our company commander asked for volunteers to go. We had heavy equipment, uh, and we had drag line that's uh, mounted on a crane, on a crane uh, and that's what we dug the ditches. We were sent there to dig ditches because the people in the town said they didn't know nothing about how this camp was uh, operated. Like they didn't couldn't believe this, and we didn't believe them. So the, the military police went and got the people that was able-bodied people out. We dug the ditches with a drag line. The people from the towns carried the bodies and put them in the ditches and covered it with the hand shovels. And this went on for about three days. So this was over 50 years ago. Yes. And I know that you've not been able to talk about, you've kept this inside you, and what made you come forward? Because today, 
there's a, I don't know how many, but there's a lot of younger people that think this is propaganda. It didn't happen, but it did, and I saw it. I know it. Okay, so when you went into Mauthausen, what exactly did you see? We saw prisoners crying, laying on the ground, dead, some walking around, wouldn't weigh 60 pounds, a huge man, maybe 60, 80 pounds, nothing but skeleton. Skinny, skeleton, walking skeletons. We saw bodies piled up beside the barracks like cordwood, dead bodies. And these were the bodies that we made the civilians put in the ditches and we dug. And they, even when they were taking those bodies out, they found some of them still alive in there. How big of an area was that of bodies? Oh, I would say, well, it's the length of the barracks, probably 40 foot long, and maybe six or eight feet high, thousands of bodies. And that they hadn't had a chance to get cremated. And they were, they were cremating in two places. There was a, a big uh, home in a hotel or something in, it was like Heart, a heart off, yeah. in, in Linz that they converted that into a crematorium. And they had three or four ovens going in, in Mauthausen. And they had two satellite camps nearby, Goosen at Ebensee, and they were cremating there. And the people in East Town said that they didn't know what was happening, and you couldn't help but know what smell, the smell of the odor in that area. What did the inmates do when they saw you pulling up in tanks? They cried and they hugged, begged. They were so glad to see us. Some of them uh, just couldn't hardly go. We didn't, you didn't, uh, we were told, uh, some of the guys started throwing candy to them and they were, had to stop right away to kill them. Because their stomachs they, had they shrunk. Their stomachs were shrunk up. They started, the, the medics come in right away, the uh, medical uh, attachment come in right away and they started feeding them and this is hard to believe, with a teaspoon of soup at a time. They could, that's all they could handle. And we, and if, if you, uh, at that time, uh, everybody smoked. <laughs> you throw a cigarette butt down and three or four of them would kill each other, get that butt. They didn't, they thought it was food. And they, and they, did, they were like, uh, actually like dogs that were starved to death and didn't know any, there, any better. And. I know in the book that I was reading, it said that um, so many or the prisoners that were able to would walk the five or six feet outside the gate and drop dead. Right, drop dead right Because there. at least they were free. They were free. So how long were you at Mauthausen to dig these? I think days. This was 50, over 50 years ago, and it's hard to remember. But there was, we had two, two backhoes out there, myself, and each back, backhoe had, it was a mounted on a portable crane, a truck. And there was a guy that, we had one guy that drove the truck, and, and I run the crane, the backhoe. We had two of those. And the fellow that, run the back, that drove the truck for me was from Pigeon, Michigan, and he's dead now. But he didn't die, he, he was alive, but he died about three years ago. Him and I were friends for years. So, um, he had to move, move the truck as you, as you dig the ditch, you, you move the truck forward there along. You know. And who put the bodies then in the grave? People from the town of Mauthausen were brought out there and, and they carried the bodies, put them on a wagon or a cart, carried them out to the trenches, put them in the trenches and covered them with shovels. Now did they, they have they, any, did they have any like contact with you? Did they like act in disbelief? They kept they saying, we didn't know, we didn't know, but we knew better because those troops, those prisoners were marched through that town each and every day, seven days a week. At daylight, they were going to the quarry, and then dark, they were coming, just before dark, they were coming back from the quarry. And, the, what, and even the ones that died at the quarry, they had to bring the bodies back because the German had to have a, a correct count. And they'd maybe be 15 or 20 dying, and the other prisoners had to carry them back. Dead. Dead. And the people were looking out these windows, and they knew what, they had to know what was going on. I know, I often use an analogy of, uh, since I've been reading this book, of it would be like 
if General Motors plant here was the concentration camp, they had to march into Lake Orion, wouldn't somebody in the houses on each side of the street, they would know, they would know Absolutely. that these people in these striped uniforms, something was going on. They would smell. I can tell you another reason why they would know. Sometimes some of those people would go out and offer them an apple or something, these, these prisoners, and the guard would say, hey, drop that apple or you go with them. So fear. Right. And the people would go back in their homes. So they knew, and that, you can't tell me, that didn't spread like a wildfire. And they knew. And there was no way in the world they could not, not know it. But uh, yeah, a lot of them, and a lot of even people today, in the camps have not too. come forward. No, they don't know. They still have denied no, it. No. Um, one of the, the things in this quarry was the steep steps going down to the 185 steps. 185 steps. And they made eight trips per day. Carrying? With, with, from 20 to 40 pound slab of marble on their back. And if they didn't get all the way up the steps, they were shoved in the pit and killed. But then carried back up? Carried back to the camp. They had to be count the bodies. Okay, now when the Germans got, or the Nazis, got wind of that the Russians were coming, the Americans were coming, they had to get rid of these bodies. So that's <laughs> how they so established, they and there were so many they couldn't. They couldn't, they didn't, no way they could do it. Okay, um, we do have pictures of, of uh, the equipment that you used and the crane and everything and how you dug the tr trenches. But do you have any contact with any survivors of the camp? Yes, uh, Sam Offen. Sarisny and Offen first door in Birmingham. I don't know Sarisny, but Sam Offen is part owner. He come to this country in 1951, and he was in this camp the day it was liberated. And he was one of those was nothing but bones. I think he said he weighed 70 pounds, and Sam's a pretty big man. Sam had 63 members of his family, of which three lived, and the rest were killed. He had two brothers uh, that were younger and he was they were kept because they could work. His father and his mother and his aunts and uncles and sisters and the rest of them were killed. Most of them at Auschwitz. They were transfer transferred from Auschwitz. Sam and his brother were transferred from Auschwitz, I think it was in January of 45, because the Russians were coming and they didn't want the Russians to get them. You know, the Germans didn't. They transferred them by train part of the way, and they walked part of the way in the winter to Mauthausen. This is uh, about 800 miles. And uh, Sam, I, I, I think I gave you a letter from Sam yes, and his brother, and uh, they explained in there that uh, the train would stop, and they'd maybe throw, give them a pail of water, and maybe throw in a loaf of bread for 100, 100 men. What did the barracks look like? Did they, they were, they were, uh, Looked like actually like a chicken coop, except roof slanted on both sides. And chicken coop usually the old ones had one angle. And they were like, and they had rows of bunks. And uh, like I say, that's a long time ago. But uh, they were at least four high and five wide. And there was no bedding of any kind, just boards. They slept on the boards. And an aisle way just long enough or wide enough for a man to walk walk through. And I think it was four or five rows of those the length of those bearings. Was there any ventilation? No, or? just windows. They had some windows, but they clear up to the top, so they couldn't get out, and they could open a window. And they had no mattresses or no mattresses. blankets no, or no, no personal no effects? Per nothing, only what they had on their back. And when you went in there, you did know that it was a concentration camp? We absolutely did. And one of the main activities was for the quarry. You knew that. Yep. Now, when you went in there, were you told anything of what their nationality or religion was? No, we 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 knew from we had seen uh, Buchenwald and a couple other camps on our spearheads. We didn't stop, but we had seen them. They were marching down, walking down the road for miles. You'd see row after row of. Uh, prisoners had been liberated, and we knew that they were uh, mostly Jewish, 
But there was other, other others in there too. In fact, there was a couple Americans in there. There's a couple Americans. Mm -hmm. Now, they were, were they called political prisoners? No, or they, were, they, were... they were combat air uh, pilots. Oh, that were captured, mm -hmm, captured. and put. Yeah. Because I never talked to them, and I know uh, they, they said there was two of them. Uh, well, the guy in our outfit talked to them. Now, were there any guards around when you? Oh yeah, or no, not when we liberated. They were one, one old man. Did he admit to being a guard? No, he said that they, they'd left him there to look after things. But and were there any women or? There was four or five women that were healthy. And were they German? I, or? I don't know. And I've never, no, none of us have ever found out. And Sam off, uh, often says he remembered them, but he don't know what they were there for. But I've got my, my ideas what they were there for. So when uh, when you decided to come for in like to start talking about this uh at the 50th anniversary i guess of this who before the before the 50th anniversary they contacted me through army records uh, they knew through army records who was in, i mean not by name but what divisions and what outfits were involved and uh, like I say, there's very few of my outfit alive, but I was one of them, and they contacted me. I wanted to know if I would, and I lived four miles from the Holocaust, and I'd never been there. And they wanted to know if I'd come and talk to them. And I told them, I talked to my wife, and yeah, sounds like, you know. You mean the Holocaust Museum in, in Farmington? West Bloomfield. In West Bloomfield. And so I went and talked to them, and they asked me if I would make an oral history, and I did, and I'm, I'm glad I did. And since then, I've been over several times over there to talk to us. They bring uh, kids from class, uh, school classes, you know, and they bring them through. And there's always a few in the class that say, well, uh, it might be. But, but if you can talk to them and tell them, you saw that, and you know. I had one man, a young man. Uh, I'm a buyer for a food co-op, nonprofit food co-op, and his girlfriend belonged to our co-op. And he was in there one day, and I didn't know him, and I didn't know, but somebody had, uh, one of the other fellow old guys and I were talking, this was after I'd made that history. And he came and said, I understand you made a history. I said, yeah. He said, who do you think you're kidding there, six million Jews? How many, how, how do they know how many Jews were killed? Did they have some rabbi there standing counting them? And that's the kind of people we have today that, that we have to, have, to, have to know that it happened. That's some, some that is one of the reasons that we are doing this tape along with you know we, the Holocaust Museum because you are the last generation that was an last, eye right. witness to this and uh, that's one of, that's one of the reasons I'm here talking to you because it has to be known it can happen and it can happen again if we don't watch our step. Um, did you have any lasting effects from? Oh, sure, it bothered me. I didn't. Uh, I didn't talk about it for years. And uh, and now when I look back, it bothers me. Not so physically, but mentally. Mentally. Can you give us a brief ha uh, summary about what happened to your unit after Mauthausen? Oh, uh, <laughs> that's kind of a funny story too. I don't know if everybody knows, but if you had 85 points in the Army in Europe after the war was over, he was eligible to be discharged right away. And I had 123. And you had a point for each year of service, a point for each child, and a point for each citation, and so on and so forth. Anyway, I ended up with 123 points, and we had some guys that had been transferred into our outfit to replace uh, the fathers who were killed and had. 70, 80 points, and they said, well, you guys are lucky. We were sent uh, for a while, was at Landshut, Germany, and we, we took, a, uh, they had us home and knocked out tanks and things back to Nuremberg so they get them all one place. Then they took the ones with the high points and took us up near La Harve to the cigarette, what they call the cigarette camps. We were gonna be sent home, jolly jolly, and be, <laughs> be <laughs> uh, discharged. 
<laughs> it ended up the guys with the less points were on their way home to be uh, trans to be re reformed and go to Japan. The war ended in Japan. They got home before we did. <laughs> uh, let's uh, show your um, uh, discharge papers. This my, no, that's, that's my, my Do you have a discharge? Yeah, honorable yeah, discharge, your sure. Your discharge yeah. papers. Mm -hmm. And if you can um, fall into this one, um, I don't know. But anyway, let's tell the... Um, you want me to read the what's yeah, on Yeah, read, read what's on there. Well, it gives my name, of course, and my social security number, my army number, 3653-5120. That's pretty good memory, isn't it? Yes, it is. 299th Engineer Battalion. That's Put your the, hand that, down here so I can That see. was the outfit that I was discharged with. We were, we were transferred to that outfit for discharge. Uh, September, Camp Atterbury, Indiana, so on. Elmer Stoll is my mailing address in Orion. My birth date's 1 January 22. Incidentally, I was the first baby in Michigan in 1922. That's why my middle name Henry. Henry Ford sent my Oh. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, eyes are blue, or hair is brown, gray now, but we're brown then. Height and weight. This is October 13, 1942, when I went in. And uh, it says here, former construction, that was my title at the time. Carbon, I was expert, rifle expert. My uh, it's called uh, Battles. Southern France, Normandy, I'll explain that later. Normandy, Northern France, Ardennes, Rhineland, and Central Europe. The Southern France, believe this or not, was 10 of us pulled out after D-Day. It was 10 of us pulled out, put on a boat, and taken around to southern France to help with the invasion there. And uh, we was there two days and brought back. You were a busy fellow, were you? Busy man, yeah. Uh, my my uh, ribbons was uh, six bronze stars, good conduct, medal, croix de guerre, which was, like I told you before, I was got for a job in France, and they all kissed me on both cheeks and the bronze arrowhead for the initial assault on Normandy. And any time you see the bronze head, arrowhead, it had to be before noon on D-Day to already get that. And we were at 6 o'clock in the morning. So. Okay, as a follow-up, what happened after World War II about your schooling and... I got my my uh, high, my diploma, what, GED they call it, mm -hmm. and uh, went back to work with General Motors. I went through the tool and die trade, uh, uh, training, got that. At Fisher Body, Pontiac, they closed the press room there, and um, I transferred to Pontiac. I went to Indiana first for a month. I said, I didn't want to move down there. I wanted to stay here. I come back, and I sat around the office for about five weeks. I, had, I was a, an assistant superintendent of a metal room, and they transferred me to Pontiac Motors. So you can't, that's, that's here. You can't leave. Mm -hmm. So I went over there as a foreman and ended up as a general foreman in Bonnet Press Metal. I also understand that you you and Betty were married on a furlough, and you didn't well, see your... I didn't see my son until he was 13 months old. And we were, we were married in uh, March of 43. And I, no, that wasn't my last furlough. I came back in, the, in Thanksgiving time. And apparently that's when all these things happened. <laughs> and he was born in September. Well, Dick, I want to thank you for this interview. And this record will be an historical record uh, available for educational purposes at the library. And as another person, it's been a pleasure and an honor to speak with you and take your history. And at this time before Memorial Day and everything, I think I, along with everybody else, salute you. And thank, thank you. you for joining us. Thank you.